We're so cheery on this fine Monday. Well, there's nothing to be happy about. We are going to start the Thick Man Inc. podcast this week for a moment with just nothing but silence in honor of Bobby, the 31-year-old oldest dog to ever live, which unfortunately passed away either last evening or this morning. So we will open with a five-second moment of silence in honor of Bobby's memory. May you rest in peace. On to the football games. And first off, we've got the New England Patriots doing what no one thought they would and humiliating the Buffalo Bills. Josh Allen had the opportunity to win the game, came up short. Patriots Stevens played better than they have all season, and the offense looked a little bit invigorated. They're missing pieces on defense. That happens every year. That happens to every team. The Bills don't look good. They're four and three right now, don't have a firm control of their division. Probably going to be a wild card if things stand how they are now. And I'll be honest, some of this goes on Josh Allen. More of it goes on Josh Allen than anyone else. Multiple touchdown game, yet again, sure. But at some point, you've got to step up and move outside the pocket. I feel like he's becoming a bit too isolated of a passer. He's only going to certain reads. He's not really stretching the field as much as he used to. And he's remaining in the pocket more than he should. You're Josh Allen. You're a tight end. It was National Tight Ends Day. Go run somebody over. You should not be putting up similar rushing yards to Mac Jones. That side of his game is starting to diminish as the passing side is stagnated. He needs to be better. The Bills defense definitely needs to be better. And there is nothing more appropriate for Bill Belichick than to get humiliated by every single other team in the league but to dominate his divisional rivals to earn his 300th win. The divisional rivals, who are clearly a better football team, by the way, much respect to Belichick, still a little bit of a fraud without Brady, but good for him on the 300th win, and the Bills, a little bit of trouble. Well, I think from this game, there's absolutely no chance the Bills make a Super Bowl push. They're just way too inconsistent. Josh Allen may be the most productive fantasy football quarterback in the NFL. We love to throw around the social media quarterback for Justin Herbert. We need to start throwing around the fantasy football label with Josh Allen. We don't know which one we're going to see week to week. Sure, he puts up cool. He puts up good numbers for your fantasy football team, but he just makes mistakes you can't make against a Patriots team that has been horrible all season long, and he finds a way to lose that game. Now, on the defensive side of things, the thing that really hurts them has been that Matt Milano injury. He is the core and centerpiece of that defense, and evidently, when he is not on the field, that defense is not the same. It did not look good against, uh, granted, I know they didn't give up a ton of points, but they should have lost to the Giants last week, and it doesn't look good against a Mac Jones-led offense that was averaging 11 points a game headed into this game. So, all in all, the Bills are not a great football team. Isaiah spoke to it. At best, they may be a wild card team. And when it comes to the Patriots side of things, I am not moved in the slightest. Like Isaiah already said, Bill Belichick finds a way to win these divisional matchups. He'll play horrible against every other team in well, the NFL. Well, he's not playing horribly at all. He's coaching horribly. I don't think Bill's strapping it up out there. Same difference. Coaching horribly, playing horribly. They play horrible against other teams and then show up for those division matchups. So for the rest of the Patriots, season I am not moved in the slightest are we just gonna start calling everybody who has a bad game of fraud now Justin Herbert's a social media quarterback Lamar's a running back Jalen Hurts is a tush push merchant Joe Burrow's a wide receiver merchant and now Josh Allen's a fantasy quarterback I get why you don't like him in fantasy I dominated you this year when we played each other in fantasy thanks in large part to the heroics of Josh Allen there's clear bias there of course but he can't play better, sure. Is he still the second best quarterback in football? Yes. Is he still going to win MVP? Who knows? MVP race is wide open right now. On to two participants in that race, Jalen Hurts dominated, in large part due to the strength of his offensive line, but dominated that Miami Dolphins defense. Dolphins did not respond. Tyreek Hill did not look as good as advertised. Tua Tungvaloa consistently pressured in the pocket. Didn't get sacked as much as he should have. That is a sign of growth in his game, but could not get anything going due to his size and the defensive tackles constantly in his face. Eagles pretty easily beat the Dolphins. Clearly, they are a better team. Right now, I think they're the best team in the NFC, given that the 49ers are dealing with two, maybe three big injuries. Philadelphia, gearing up for the Super Bowl push, not slowing down, keeping it rolling, keeping it moving, brotherly shove. Taylor Swift's boyfriend's brother plays for that team. So they got all the momentum in the world behind them. Wouldn't it be something if we got a rematch of the Super Bowl, but this time featuring Taylor Swift with the T Kelsey brothers doing post-game, pre-game interviews talking about T-Swift. Kelsey goes for a cool 150 yards. Jalen Hurts gets five rushing touchdowns thanks to the tush push. That is what the NFL is setting up. I've just realized. So 
Chiefs Eagles Super Bowl yet again. Taylor Swift Bowl inbound. Kelsey Bowl 2.0 inbound. And the Eagles are rolled. Well, I know I predicted the Dolphins to win this game, and I could take the easy out like many Dolphins fans are whining about when it comes to the refing we saw in this game, but that is not what I took away from this game. The things I said I thought could go wrong for the Dolphins did wind up going wrong. It was incredibly difficult for them to play in Philadelphia with how loud that crowd was. That was a major contributing factor, and something I personally uh, underestimated heading into the game is how lackluster that Dolphins rushing attack would be against that Eagles uh, defensive line, against their front seven. And, you know, the Dolphins had the number one rushing attack heading into the game, but they're not built the same way the Titans rushing attack is. For lack of a better expression, it often feels a little gimmicky with uh, some of the end arounds and pitches that they have. And when the Eagles front seven is winning at the line of scrimmage every single play, that rushing attack and the speed they have in their backfield with Raheem Mostert, the end arounds that they get to Waddle and Tyreek Hill, they simply weren't all that effective and that dr had a great impact on their passing attack. So I underestimated their rushing attack. I'm not overly worried when it comes to the rest of their season. Um, and I think they simply got out game planned and out coached heading into this game. I don't think it was some drastic, you know, the refs robbed the game. Now, certainly might have the score been a little bit closer. Yes, if the refs, if certain calls went a certain way, but I don't think the win was robbed from the Dolphins. Well, once again, horrible officiating in the NFL played a real factor in the foul score. What else is new? It's the Philadelphia way the refs get involved one way or the other for the good or the bad. It's more so they're not winning on the tackles and their tight ends aren't sealing the edge. I can't do that outside stuff, zone plays, stretches, sweeps, pitches, all that, if the tackles aren't controlling the edge, and that was really where they were getting screwed up. Obviously, they were never going to be able to run inside, and Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter were going to prevent the interior guys from climbing to backers, but the edge was the area of weakness in the run game, not just the defensive front. It's really those two tackles bullied all not. Well, they, I mean, they were dealing with some injuries, so there's that part of it, but I, the run, the run game was much. Everybody's dealing with injuries at this point in the year. I am unmoved by, well, this team is hurt anymore. No longer a definitive thing. Speaking of a team battling through injuries, finding a way to win regardless, Ravens, pretty good. Pretty GD good. Mark Andrews, big performance on National Tight End Day. Lamar Jackson, 255 passing yards in the first half. Multiple touchdowns, still a running threat. And this is the team in the AFC right now which looks like they can challenge the Chiefs. Might be able to beat them in the playoffs. Who knows? Hopefully they get home field and hopefully the refs don't screw them over. But it's them, the Chiefs, and maybe the Bills reinsert themselves later in the year. But Baltimore looked phenomenal. Detroit... You're the Lions. What do you expect? You played a competent opponent for once. The receivers did not drop 17 passes. They didn't spot you a pick six. You were going to lose this game. Congratulations to Baltimore. Congratulations to uh, Zay Flowers, Mark Andrews. Congratulations to the defense. I thought they were a lot more rattled than they were. I thought they were just aggregating stats early in the year. But no, turns out pretty real depth, pretty real coaching. The uh, Baltimore defense coordinator, name is eluding me right now, will be gainfully employed as a head coach by this time next season. I'm not that worried about the Lions. They never really were going to be the team in the NFC. If you thought they were, you're wearing a nice blue jersey a blue hat, perhaps a blue scarf. But we know the Lions are, and we now know what the Baltimore Ravens are. Well, And, you know, I'd like to say I did point out in our predictions prior to last week that the Ravens' defense has been for real. They just haven't been tested yet. And I think they played a, a Lions offense that has been really good, and they showed that despite some of the injuries on that defense, that they are going to go out there and sh do their best to shut down the other team, which they did no matter what, no matter who they roll out onto that field. And it was too much for the Lions. Now, the big difference in this game is that the Ravens have another gear on offense they can reach because Lamar Jackson is their quarterback. He's playing like he was during his MVP campaign, running the ball, throwing the ball at an elite level. He's doing everything. He looks like MVP Lamar Jackson again. And as much as I like Jared Goff and what he has become and what he's done for that uh, Lions offense, he is not Lamar Jackson, and he does not have that second gear, especially when they get down early to a Ravens offense that has Lamar Jackson at quarterback. So to me, those are the biggest things we learned from that game. You spoke to their defense already, um, and Lamar Jackson was a difference maker. The real biggest thing we learned about Detroit, uh, dis dismiss Jared Goff all you want. That Everyone, wasn't a every dismissal of Jared felt Goff. Felt like a dismissal of Jared Goff. We learned that they do actually need David Montgomery. They need someone who can go in between the tackles, set the tempo, get a rough three, four yards, 
really keep the game on schedule. Put up good fancy stats, I'm sure he did. Jameer Gibbs, though, not the answer to that. Not able to really get in there and grind. Receiving threat, certainly better than Montgomery, but they need Dave Montgomery to be on the uh, fullest offensive. Well, I mean, I, Jameer Gibbs averaged 6.2 yards a carry, so I wouldn't say yeah. he was a drawback from the... Oh, he was definitely a drawback. They couldn't run the style of offense they wanted to. They may have picked up more yards on chunk plays, but I think Dave Montgomery being there would have definitely improved the uh, Lions' chances. If you watched them all year, it's not just, oh, they're slinging it around the running outside zone. They're going in between the tackles a lot. That's why Dave Montgomery's yards per carry is not that good. He's running at linebackers and defensive tackles. Gibbs didn't have to do that. Sure, they picked up the yards, but when those plays didn't work, they didn't stay on schedule. Failed a little bit more, which meant, hey, we got to throw more. And with the hole they got put in early with the Ravens dropping three touchdowns in the first quarter, I think, there was no chance of coming back then. Maybe Montgomery stems that bleeding a little bit, makes this 14-7 to game going into the second. This well, is all purely hypothetical. We don't know. I just think Dave <laughs> Montgomery makes the lines a lot better. It makes them a better team when you have both those backs at your disposal, but when you get down early, you're probably not playing three yards in a cloud of dust style football. You're not going to get down early if you're playing three yards in a cloud of dust style football as much early. Speaking of getting down early, a team which always finds a way to make things somewhat competitive in the second half, the Los Angeles Chargers once again humiliated, this time by the Kansas City Chiefs. Taylor Swift doing uh, victory dances in the press box with Brittany Mahomes, the Chargers super fan at Arrowhead Stadium. Some say she's a media plant. I kind of tend to agree. Who cares? We know Justin Herbert is. We know the Chargers coaching staff is. We know their defense is. Is this really a surprising outcome? What fan was feeling optimistic about the Chargers going on the road to play the Chiefs? Who thought this was going to be an upset? Who thought Travis Kelsey was not going to dominate, humiliate, eviscerate, and really just set that franchise back a decade? Did anyone? Th did you? Did you think that? I did not. You didn't think, think that. that. Even he didn't think that. And he's an idiot. Chiefs <laughs> okay. eviscerated, eviscerated the Chargers. Tells me all I need to know. I've known already what I need to know. Herbert ain't it. The coaching ain't it. The defense ain't it. They are failing to utilize the weapons they have. The running game was not a legitimate option. The passing game, ignoring their second best receiver right now, Keenan Allen. Kind of getting a little bit old. The athleticism is not letting him get the yards he should be getting if he's going to be this much of a focal point. And really, I'll need to say more. The Chargers are not going to win anything with their current administration. To compare Phillip Rivers to Justin Herbert is a great insult to Phillip Rivers. Phillip Rivers was not blessed with the God-given athletic ability that Justin Herbert is. And at least in the regular season, Phil was a lot more clutch and performed better under pressure than Herbert. Well, you said a lot of things there. You threw in they're not targeting their second best receiver. You threw in well, Phillip Rivers actually, there I'll the say end. third best. The uh, second best receiver is currently hurt. But. You know, so point being, you said a lot of things, and I'll, I'll take some time to address those. But the first thing I want to say is kind of speak to what you said is that we if you're being honest with yourself heading into this game with what we've seen this season and what we know of these quarterbacks and of these teams we all knew what was going to happen we know there's a Patrick Mahomes and then a massive gap between the rest of the league he threw for over 400 yards four touchdowns Travis Kelsey went for 150 they balled out they did what we expected them to do with what we've seen from the Chargers defense and if you're Chargers ownership right now how do you have that defensive head coach how do you watch the best team in your division put up over 400 passing yards on you and you still keep that head coach he's he's he has been doing nothing for your defense he did nothing for your defense last night against the best quarterback and best team in the nfl that you need to eclipse if you ever want to win a super bowl and he's not going to do anything for you moving forward so I would be shocked if Brandon Staley makes it through the rest of the season. If he's still there after the season, I feel bad for Justin Herbert. And when it comes to you threw in just Smalley Quentin Johnson's why are you sliding Josh Palmer like that? He has been playing great. He's been getting targeted like Williams. he's playing great. I'll say that much. Just nervous seems to like him. Maybe uh, Quinn Johnson missed the uh, quarterback wide receiver slumber party. I don't know. There's a conspiracy theory there for sure. There's a reason Quentin Johnson is not getting... When you draft a receiver in the first round, he's the second receiver off the board. You don't draft him to not throw him the ball. You don't draft... They don't even call screens to him. One of his best... Actually, they did call a screen to him. Just nervous just didn't throw the screen pass. He, one of his best assets in college was a run after the catch because of how she does, even with how tall he is, he, his run after the catch was some of the best in college. And they haven't even used that on short routes, screens. They still throw screens to Keenan Allen. They keep feeding the ball to Keenan Allen. So they drafted him in the first round. There's a reason they're not using him. And it's clearly something that they've seen 
off the field in practice or in the film room. The only possible reason you are ignoring an open receiver, well, there are two reasons. One, your quarterback either is not seeing him or willfully not seeing him. The second one, you think he has a major drop issue. If that's a legitimate issue- I didn't say that. I'm talking here. Those are the only two legitimate reasons. He either has a drop issue or he's got some issue with the quarterback. If he's open, throw him the ball. If he drops it, fine. But if he catches it, you have 60 yards and a touchdown. There were multiple plays, which he got, could have absolutely cranked up. He beat a cornerback deep in man coverage, no safety help, against the Chiefs just this Sunday. Justin Herbert didn't even look at him. Wide open, didn't even look at him. Three steps of separation, much bigger body than the cornerback, ignored him. He's got six foot nine, a six foot nine inch wingspan. Do you know how ridiculous that is for a six two receiver? His catch radius is up there with tight ends, and Herbert's not chucking to him. This is on Herbertson, or they just have zero confidence in him, in which case, why is he getting 50% of the snaps? What's the point of that? He should be getting more of the snaps. Exactly. He should be getting more of the snaps. If you have if, no if, confidence in him, with don't how, put him out there half the time. If you have confidence in him, throw him the ball. It's Herbert's fault. I'll say that. How about that? Does that make you happy? I don't think it's Herbert's fault. I think it's clearly, I think it's probably the, the coaching staff's fault. I mean, we've seen what they've done with the defense. Why would we think that they draft this first round receiver and are unable to work him into the offense? I think it's a coaching staff's fault. First of all, that they even drafted him just to not use him. I think that's unacceptable. Well, the coaching staff didn't draft him first off. There's a the front office in combination with the coaching staff. Clearly not in combination with the coaching staff because they're not using him. One hand is not talking to the other in that Chargers organization. Which makes it even a worse situation. All I'm saying is there are two, three issues on that Chargers team and one of them's not Quentin Johnson. They've got much bigger fish to fry than the uh, rookie wide receiver who's not being properly utilized. But last week I promised you that you could talk about the Giants if they won again. Lo and behold played a hideous game against the Washington Commanders. But they did win so you get a... Um, I'll give you two minutes. Two minutes to talk about the two New minutes. York football meantime, Giants. Oh, and you're going to read and ignore everything I have to say. When it comes to the Giants, you know, Isaiah, you love to kind of bash Brian Dable. Do I, I need to get my headphones? I'm reading here. <laughs> talk to them, not me. You love to bash Brian Dable, and you love to bash his coaching job, but if it were the Vikings or any other team in the NFL that was winning football games with Justin Pugh as their left tackle and all the other names they have across that offensive line, you would be praising the coaching job performance. What you get from Tyrod Taylor is what he's worth at $8 million. And unfortunately, it's the same thing you get from Daniel Jones at $40 million. So Tyrod, I know I, I had that TikTok that I talked about how good Tyrod is, and I talked about how good he was. The thing is, he's a below average starting quarterback, one of the better backup quarterbacks in the NFL, but you get the same, it's the same thing as Daniel Jones. And you're really distracting me with that magazine over there. You can at least act somewhat engaged. I'm not, I don't care about the Giants. Really, I don't think many people care about the Giants. They scored 14 points against a team which got lit up by the Bears and the Broncos. This is still a bad team. This is a bad coach. This is a bad organization. Fire everybody besides maybe, uh, you know, I hear this Darius Slate guy's pretty good. You can keep him around. <laughs> okay. And, you know, I, I still think it's not a good team. I'm not all of a sudden, oh, wow, they beat the Commanders. They're still not a good team. But I think Brian Dable is a very good head coach. I think he will continue to be a good head coach. And the only thing that will get him out of the Giants organization is the ownership. Because I find I'm fed up with the ownership at this point. And, you know, I just want to... There's not much else to say about that game. There was nothing that happened in the second half. 30 was, seconds. And there were two passing touchdowns. Something that I want to address that probably Isaiah's would be one to push to the narrative of is that say, people are talking about Saquon Barkley getting traded. And, you know... If I'm being completely objective and unbiased, that's a player, if it was another team, I'd probably make the argument that they should trade him because he's a running back on the last year of his deal. And the Giants don't have much of a future with Danny, paying Daniel Jones $40 million. But what I want to say is I don't think the Giants will ever trade him just based on what John, how John Mara has handled the organization. I mean, they had all the nonsense, nonsense that Odell put you through. Uh, with the, the the video in France with the pizza box and fighting the net, everything else that he took part in. And then you have Saquon Barkley, who is the it's a epitome. very nice dress right there. Show the camera. Is the epitome of a stand-up player. He says he wants to play for your organization. That is not a player that John Mara 
uh, is an advocate for the front office to get rid of. And he often sticks his hand and meddles in the Giants' business and doesn't let the G uh, GM make decisions for himself. Granted, it also sounds like Joe Shane wants to keep him. So I just don't think he's going to get traded. Not necessarily what I want or I don't really have strong feelings towards, but... They're not going to trade him because that is the only star player the New York Giants have right now. Jalen Hyatt looks pretty good. Jalen Hyatt is a scrub. I mean, your two best players are a nose tackle and an offensive lineman. Nobody cares about those positions. If you have Saquon, you got one marketable guy until he goes in the IL. That's why they're not trading him. No, one, you go ahead and throw around that Jalen Hyatt is a scrub while he makes over-the-shoulder catches on the sideline and they barely use him. And now you're to... Ha! Because you don't want to be called out on your hypocrisy. It's blasphemy. This is still recording. I'll play a black screen with a picture of my face. The hypocrisy with Jalen Hyatt and Quentin Johnson is ridiculous. Unacceptable.